um, Klaus Schöning uh, is uh, the second speech. He, he holds a bachelor's degree in biochemistry from Freie Universität in Berlin. He also obtained a diploma in fine arts from the Academy of Fine Arts in Dresden. Currently, Klaus is a master schüler under the guidance of Susan Phillips and studying art and science in, at the University of Applied Arts in Vienna. He is presenting a talk on metamaterial or circular material uh, studies. Please welcome. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so um, in this talk I will concentrate a little bit more on the artistic research process rather on the outcomes because I thought this would be more interesting for a con conference about um, artistic research. Um, so, but we will also see a little bit the works in the end. <laughs> um, perhaps a quote to begin. Um, uh, things are exactly as they are yet never exactly as they appear. That's a quote by Timothy Morton, um, an interesting philosopher that's trying to find kind of a framework around ecology and how we can think it in an um, abstract or philosophical way. And um, it was also s somebody who kind of strongly influenced me in my project. Um, besides also Karen Barat, which is um, a feminist theorist and she's writing a lot about representations. And um, since we do all do art or are connected to art, representations I think are kind of our bread and butter. Um, so yeah, um, can we please have the next slide? Um, so yeah, um, oh, okay, I can do it myself. Okay, thank you. Um, so, yeah, this is um, perhaps also referent to uh, Reitis, which we heard uh, before the lunch break, and he said he doesn't want to go to the forest and kind of portray this romantic image. This is a very romantic image of a landscape, um, but what if I told you that it's actually not a landscape? Um, it's actually a painting of a landscape. Well, yeah, that's very banal, um, but it's something that we kind of forget when we look at representations, right? We forget the thing that they actually are and we only take them for what they point towards. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, we all get seduced and I think this is also something that is nice, right? It's something that is kind of an effect, it happens without thinking. We just look at this and see something there. So this is, uh, this is the next thing here. Um, so this is, um, this is something, an interesting drawing actually, and somebody, uh, Leonardo da Vinci, tried to draw something that is apparently not visible at all. So um, here, representations are literally something that showing something that is actually not visible. In this case, um, scholars, historical art historians now um, have the latest opinion that uh, Da Vinci tried to draw air currents here. And air is not visible, at least not directly. So this is a really interesting concept, showing something that is actually not visible, visualizing it. And this kind of became the paradigm of um, scientific uh, representations. Um, so yeah, it's interesting to show stuff that is actually not visible. So in this case here, this is a visualization of a protein, um, very common protein used in uh, biochemical research. Um, and proteins are not visible. You can never see them kind of Showing something that is not visible is kind of getting to the point where we have to ask ourselves what seeing actually is. I mean, this is so small, you will never see this with light. You can only kind of show it in another way. And 
showing something that is invisible always has to be some form of artistic approach because you have to make something out of nothing in some sense. Um, so yeah, um, so seeing is kind of a biological process. It's some people think it's only something that happens in our brain, right? But um, um, well, there was somebody who also thought this, like seeing is something that happens in your brain. This looks a little bit like it, because um, this is this famous painting by Magritte, and um, this is not a pipe, actually. Yes, exactly like the um, romantic landscape that I showed in the very beginning is not actually a landscape. This is also not a pipe. So now here it's really just light reflected from the surface, which looks like a pipe. And um, how I always understood this work is that Magritte kind of wanted us to tell that, well, seeing is something that happens in your brain. It's something that has to do a lot with cognition. So if you put stuff in a way that looks exactly like something, you will see that something. And this is kind of a fundamental insight into how representations work, how they affect us, in a sense. But um, I think seeing is also, it's not only happening in our brains, in our cognition, in our minds, it's also something that happens outside somewhere else, right? Because you need to see something. Um, and even if this something is then reflected in your new neurons or something like this, there has to be something to start on. So what I'm just trying to say, I'm a realist. I think there is something out there. I think not everything is constructed. And um, um, so yeah, this is, these were the early works that I did kind of following this line of thought. What my kind of meditation on what representations are. And here, this is very much kind of similar to what Magritte was doing. Um, but here, in a sense, um, it is actually this would be the pipe if this would be Magritte's painting. Like, this is kind of the same painting like Magritte, but under it is like, this is really the pipe. This is actually the pipe. Because here, um, I was taking pigments. So pigments is actually the stuff that makes paint colorful and um, I was kind of um, printing the structural formulas and the molecular formulas and the systematic names of these pigments with the pigments itself so that basically the pigments are representing themselves. It's also something that is really not very traditional in art. Traditionally in art you always take a material to show something else, right? You use, for example, you use this green pigment, um, it's a phthalo green pigment, but you paint an apple with it. So the apple kind of now stands in this weird representa representational um, relation to this pigment here. Nobody cares about this, right? Nobody knows what this painting is made of. Everybody just sees the apple. But here in this case, I'm always saying this is really the pipe. This is really, I mean, if this object would be here originally, this is just an image of the thing, but if it would be here really in this room materially, this would be really this green pigment, phthalo green, and this would be a pyrrole red pigment. Um, so that was kind of my comment on representations. It's, it's also a comment on originality, right, because you don't really, what is original to this here is not clear anymore because it is self-referential. It kind of spins around, you know. It is what it shows and it shows what it is. And in some sense also here, in a kind of an interesting tickling sense, this is, oh, sorry, I hope I, uh, yeah. Um, so in some interesting kind of tickly sense, this is um, what, um, what, what um, people may describe as a strange loop. So this is kind of a feedback loop because it spins around in a sense. And it also defies the question what actually originally this thing is. I mean, this is just a scientific representation of it. This is also not the substance itself, right? It's only repre representing a representation of itself. So there you kind of already see this nesting of concepts. And what I like about this is that 
kind of it also defies this discourse about what is originally there, what the deep meaning of something is, and what the superficial meaning of something is. Because when, you ha when you're dealing with self-reference, then what you see at the very top level of the hierarchy is the same that you see on a very, very deep level. So in a kind of strange sense, you already see, you can see through the structure by just looking at the top of it. Because what you see on the surface is what you will see at the very, very deep depths of it. Yeah, I was very lucky because in Dresden where I was studying, so these, are f these were from 2018, I'm, I'm kind of following these ideas now since 2016, and I was very lucky when I started in Dresden Fine Arts because in Dresden is one of the biggest die collections, historic die collections of Europe. It's located at the Technical University. And I was very, very happy because um, Professor Hartmut uh, Hartmann, who is kind of in uh, like a emerited professor, He's, his hobby is basically managing this die collection and so he was very happy that somebody was interested in it and so I could go there and research a little bit into dyes. Dyes are just, it's just stuff that is colorful. Pigments is basically unsoluble, un unsoluble stuff that is colorful. Um, and, and there is like a massive collection of all kinds of substances, a lot of them are toxic. And this is interesting because um, I could learn a little bit about this connection between pigments, our craving for colors, we all love colors, you know. I mean, art is a lot about colors, I mean, individual sense, um, or about contrast, you know. Even if you don't have colors, you need some form of contrast, and for contrast, you need a pigment. Um, so, um, and interestingly, what I learned is that pigments were actually the second big product of the chemical industry. The first big mass product of the chemical industry was TNT. So basically, the first need of humans is bomb something, explode, let something explode, kill something, and the second craving is colors. So that's interesting. And the chemical industry really grew on that. Um, and tragically or interestingly also the big um, conglomerates, for example, in the Second World War in Germany that had produced those chemical weapons of mass destruction, um, this conglomerate was called IG Farben. So, and literally that is, that is translated into um, kind of interest group colors. So all these companies that were producing those war substances, like horrorful, uh, horrible, horrible substances, they were actually companies that produced colors. And that is something that is it's an historic fact, right? And whenever we use colors as a material, it's something that is there, right? That the history um, of chemical warfare is very, very much entangled with the industrial production of colors. Um, and it's, it's basically this chemistry, this organic chemistry that enabled all these wonderful new colors that was also funded by customers paying for the colors. That's the chemistry that led to a lot of those very dangerous substances that were tried out in the, in the Second World War, but it also led to all the chemistry, the biological chemistry that is done now uh, for the um, pharmacological industrial complex. It's the same chemistry that they use now, the same paradigms um, to discover new drugs. And the, the, the chemical industry is not thinkable without colors. So it was really, it's really interesting that this is such a fundamental craving of humans, colors. Um, so yeah, I was now talking about circular meanings, representations that represent themselves materially, colors as, as something that is kind of, that has an industrial history. Um, so my next step was a little bit to think about not only meanings as circles, but also materials as a circles. And I was working before, I was already working with a lot of um, people that do restoration because I'm really very much interested in the materiality of images, right, of art objects. So, and the academic discipline that is really combining these two, like material science and art, is restoration. And it's actually for the sake of conserving or restoring materials. So that is something that is also 
that is a tradition, right? We work on materials and arts in order to conserve and restore materials. And here is, for example, somebody um, in the um, painting collection of Dresden. And um, so this is how paintings are restored. It's really a painstaking uh, process that takes a lot of time. And they're effectively kind of reworking the materials. They're very much informed about what the materials are, how they behave, how to save them. Um, so when I thought about this, we only work this out in order to restore and conserve materials I thought this is exactly not what I want to do, right? Because I wanted circular materials. And this is not circular, this is a straight line into the future that just endlessly goes into the future. Like you basically have a line and whenever the line ends, you draw it further in the future. Because you want to save your assets, you want to save cultural heritage. Um, and it's something that is very much a European thing, I would say. Here is a lot of cultural heritage, so I would also say here is the most expertise in saving this heritage because it's a huge capital that is in Europe. I would even say it's the, it's the one biggest asset that Europe still has, right? We are not really a huge, we, are not, we don't have anymore a big military force, we are not anymore a big economic force, but what we have is cultural heritage, cultural capital, as somebody, some people says, and in order to save it, we are also, the, I think, the world best region of conservation. And this is exactly not what I wanted to do, because I wanted also circular materials, right? I wanted to go from circular meanings to circular materials, but um, restoration is actually very good to tra translate this, because these are people that want to conserve materials, and I always told them, okay, well, what is when we do the exact opposite? What is when we want to have materials that kind of degrade as fast as possible? Um, so. And now I kind of, I'm kind of calling out for a new form of academic discipline. It's a form of material science and art, but not in order to conserve and to restore art, but in order to actually recycle the materials. Um, I don't know how this might call itself. I don't know, I have some, I, I got some ideas, like I don't know, um, decomposition studies of art or something like this, or uh, decomposition of archives. And um, yeah, perhaps, I don't know, everything needs to change in the next hundred years. We'll have profound changes everywhere, perhaps also art. Um, and the way how we treat art and how we treat um, cultural heritage will change. Um, so, um, yeah. So, for example, so then I was looking at how we restore stuff, you know, how we kind of deal with the past also, because restoring something is also kind of relating something to the past somehow. Even if we just erase all the kind of the little marks that time has left on the objects, there's still kind of a relation. And here, this is the prom prominent example from Dresden, right? This is the Frauenkirche here before the war, the Second World War. This is the Frauenkirche after the Second World War. And it actually was like this for a very long time. It was like this for, I think, almost 50 years. It was really just a rubble of stones in the middle of the city. It was really reminding everybody what actually happened there. Um, and then here, almost visible, uh, this, this is not part of the Frauenkirche, but this is how it looks now. And they actually took an interesting approach. So you here you see some dark stones and you see some more brighter stones. The dark stones are the original stones from the original church and the brighter ones are the new ones. After time, this will all look dark, right? After 100 years, all the stones will look dark and it will look probably a little bit like the original one did. Um, interesting. Um, I mean, it's a beautiful building, but I always kind of have a uncanny feeling when I look at it. It's almost like kind of a revision of history a little bit. I mean, they try to do it, they try to incorporate it, but um, just projecting into the future, it will look as if nothing happened. Here's another approach from Japan. So this is the Ise Shrine, and this shrine is 1,400 years old, apparently. So the Frauenkirche in Dresden is a little joke to this age, 
but apparently this thing is 1,400 years old. It doesn't look like it, it's just a little woodshed. How could that survive for 1,400 years? Well, every 20 years, they tear it down, they deconstruct the whole thing, and they build it up again. But they still kind of say it's 1,400 years old. Interestingly, they don't conserve the materials, but they conserve the knowledge. And I mean, is there really a better way to conserve the knowledge than to deconstruct something and to reconstruct it again? I mean, we also, in the restoration sciences, there is a lot of struggle because a lot of techniques have been lost over time because nobody's doing it anymore. People just restore stuff, they don't rebuild it. So, I think this is a pretty interesting um, approach here because it's really the knowledge that has been conserved here and not the materials. And it's, and uh, I don't have to say, right, this, this shrine is totally from uh, renewable materials. Otherwise, there would be shrines lying around everywhere there. Well, it's not like this. Those shrines, they decompose, they get reused, they are circular in, in, in their materiality. Um, so yeah, where to go now? Well. As I said, I wanted to go into archives because the archives are kind of like the endpoints of the materials, right? It's if a material, the life of a material is like a journey, you know, at some point you get to the road where you cannot pass anymore and sometimes this is the archive because in the archive you're just stuck as a material. You don't change anymore. You're just lying around and if you're lucky, somebody opens the drawer once in a while, looks at you and then you get tucked away. So I wanted to like go into the archives and think about those materials. So this year is the um, mineral collection of the Natural History Museum in Vienna. And I was very, very lucky that Uwe Kolic, um, the director of the mineral collection said yes when I asked him, well, can I borrow some stones from your archive? Um, so I took those stones and um, I wanted to the, uh, to compose them, uh, compost them, basically decompose them. Like parallel also, I, I was um, reaching out to several producers of pigments and I was asking if they have compostable pigments and so a lot of also producers sent me like samples, I also got them. But yeah, I mean, more interestingly, I was working with the stones of the, um, of the Natural History Museum, so this is for example, this is an azurite stone um, I um, changed the stone a little bit, crushed it into pieces. I mean, they borrowed the stone, so I probably have to give it back at some point. I mean, they said it's an unlimited lease, you know, so... Um, but I crushed the stone and then I kind of milled it down into the finest powder that I could get. So this one here is 63 micrometers. Um, I actually wanted to get it even smaller, so if anybody has a colloid mill that can grind down materials to a nanoscale, I'm very much interested. Um, so yeah, I, I think the stone, probably the stone was happy that finally something was happening again to it. Um, and then I tried to make paint out of this stone powder. So I tried many different stuff, so this is some, some uh, failed stuff uh, from uh, the laboratory, um, because you have to find the right binder, and I since I want to make everything kind of circular, it has to be a compostable binder. Um, so it's basically all food grade. It's a little bit like cooking, you know? It's not like handling chemicals, but it's more like cooking a paint that is a paint that looks good, that is also working good, but it is completely compostable. And here are some tests with concentrations of pigments that I use that I know, okay, so this is how much mass of pigments I have to get into the binder, how the binder is and stuff like this. And um, these are prints here. Um, so what I printed actually also in tradition, right, of my, of my series. So these are um, electromicroscopic images of the pigment that I printed. So this is uh, basically, um, it's also a synthetic pigment. Uh, and this is basically also kind of another way how the pigment shows itself, right? It shows just electro micro, uh, electron microscop uh, microscopic images of itself. Um, so yeah, completely compostable pigment, completely compostable paint. 
So what did I do? I composted it. Um, again, I was very lucky because um, because the um, University for Life Science and Natural Resources was so kind to um, lend me resources. I'm very grateful to Professor Michael Sauer, who kind of um, conciliated me to uh, Professor Christian Safiu and Gerald Lang, who conducted my experiments. So this is basically a um, composting experiment. So this is the compost here. This is the compost leaking. Actually, compost smells really good when it's done right. This is the compost here. And you see here a little bit, so this, these are the prints that are kind of just in the compost. You just throw them in the compost, you mix it a little bit. I mean, they do it scientifically here, but it's really not super different from a compost just in the wild. You just throw stuff on a rubble and it starts to decompose. Um, so this is how it looks after two weeks. A little bit brownish. Um, this is how it looks after 11 weeks. Um, and uh, you see that kind of uh, the color kind of gets washed away because the binder is decomposing. But even the cotton on which I printed, it's just pure cotton, just as easy as that. The cotton itself is also decomposing because cotton is uh, plant based. Um, so, and this is the latest installation from the series. So, these are um, four stones from the Natural History Museum. This is azurite, malachite, and hematite. So, these are three stones from their mineral collection. I grinded them, I made uh, paints out of them, I printed it, and then I um, composted them. And as you see here, I didn't compose the whole thing. So, here in the middle, this one is basically intact, and the edges are uh, composted. And also, what I printed are actually um, molecular representations of the crystal lattice. So it's also kind of representing itself in a structural way. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, the series, this, this project has more and more developed into kind of a m method, um, also a material collection, um, and it has very much also stayed conceptual. And now I kind of treat it as a platform. So a platform on which many things can be developed, right? It's just a set of methods and materials um, with which you can produce compostable artworks. And they don't have to, I don't know, they don't have to be about composting or about circularity, right? I also think it's viable to just produce art in such a way but also to think about what we do with all the archives that we have, with all the cultural heritage that we have, because it's not sustainable, right? You cannot save everything. The archives, I know a lot of archives that are already full to the brim, um, and people don't know what to do with all these objects. They don't want to throw them aw away because they're valuable, because they are also financial assets in a lot of situations. But yeah, I mean, the question is, do we really want to keep this going, like save everything, or do we want to start more broadly think about circular materials? Because that's basically what we have to do, right? We're doing this in all kinds of other fields, and I think also the art and also the restoration studies needs to be confronted with uh, circular materials in some way. I mean, I'm not saying that we should just destroy all the art. I'm not kind of embracing total you know, iconoclasm. I'm also aware that in a lot of regions in the world, art is being lost forever, that shouldn't be lost. But on the other hand, we should be careful what, to, what we wish to stay for, right? There are huge plastic garbage patches in the ocean. Nobody want, wanted these, um, but they're kind of restoring themselves and living on. Um, so, yes. Um, just a quick remark for the future. Um, I'm having, I'm, I'm very glad also that I found a new um, kind of collaboration partner with the Greta project. Also Karl is actually here, Karl Anna from this project. They're developing sustainable materials for uh, theatrical sculptures. And I'm very fond to work with them, um, with Karl and uh, Professor Ulrich Eisler, who will have a presentation here tomorrow. I'm very fond um, to um, try out new materials and new uh, production method methods. So yes, 
that's it. I hope it's not too long and uh, thank you. Any question in the sala, in the room or somewhere? One is a practical question, so um, where you expose the material uh, so that uh, they degrade uh, the, those paintings, the, the one, uh, where they were, were kept in those uh, five or uh, four or 11 weeks? They were outside. Uh, this is the first question, uh, just a, qu a practical question. The second is more theoretical question, and it relates with your pigment showing itself, no? the, the red one. So. Let's say, let's make an ass assumption, a theoretical thing. You change in the uh, uh, Chamo, uh, scientific uh, representation, you change intentional or unintentionally one letter. What happens to your work? Um, this is just, <laughs> just a yeah, I mean, I am um, sort of the first question is a little bit of technical stuff, right? How it is composed. The compost, the art. Yeah, so I just put them into a compost. You know, you know it's just a normal compost. I mean, the compost, if, if it's a it's super small compost, it won't work that fast. It has to be a little bit bigger because then, because when it's bigger, then the temperature gets higher because the microbes, they produce heat. And if it's a little bit bigger, they get more heat, they're faster. So if it's like a one times one meter, like a one square meter compost, that's quite fast. That's quite fast. That's like, I don't know, 14, 16 weeks, it's completely gone fast. Um, so it's really not high tech, right? I don't need a huge industrial complex. I just need a compost. Um, and uh, the other thing is, um, I'm, I'm very aware that the representations here, they are already inside of a very tight framework, right? They're already part of a scientific um, method, of a scientific practice that is very much tied to a lot of things. So I'm not saying that this is the material, right? So this is just one way how to rep uh, represent the material and it's a, it's a way that I'm familiar with, I know how it works, and I also know that this is a very, it's a very reproducible and very precise way. So I very much believe in this representation of the material than in other forms of representation. Right? So that's why I chose them, because they are, for me, they're convincing. And if I would change something in there, it would basically fall out of the system. It would be kind of, perhaps it would criticize the system, it would make perhaps a little bit fun of it, or it wouldn't take it so serious, but um, it would be kind of, I would say then it would be more a comment on that way of representing it. But I mean, since I worked with these formulas and I know how they kind of grew historically also from the science background, I know how useful they are and I know also that per perhaps they're even more real than that because those substances were produced on, this, on these models, on these ways of representation. So this is also how a certain way of representations in hexagons, in letters, a letter is not an atom, you know, a, a line is not a bond of an atom, but this is how they are represented, and this way, this very specific way of representations enabled the production of these materials. So in a way, this way of representations is also enabling new regimes of production from which these particular pigments came. So that makes this way of representation even more tangible and real, because it enabled to, that these substances came into life, came into scope uh, in the first place. The compost. Well, I mean, there are hundreds of uh, different use cases. So normally, I I'm just at at some place because I cannot do it in my own. I don't have a garden. I'm not as fortunate to have a garden, so I just ask other people to lend me their compost and, um, and, and they just reuse this soil to use it to, to nurture other plants, basically. I mean, we have a lot of uh, need for soil, so... <laughs> Uh, 
Um, you already mentioned that we are going to work together, together. Um, but my question is about other people who have similar approaches, maybe. I mean, when we think of um, land art, for example, which is like a very basic, very simple example of art that goes away after a time. So if you arrange stones close to the water, they eventually will be washed away, maybe a day later. Um, but is there anyone else, anybody you know about who is following more like your approach right now? Um, I mean, I, I think there are many. There are many, I don't know if it's they are really also tying this into a conceptual framework. I think in the last years it's been a lot of people had more interest in using sustainable materials like plant-based dyes um, and also land art. I think it wasn't really very much about the material itself. How I answer, it was more like relocating the artwork outside the gallery somewhere else. Um, and, and this thing here is not really, it's, it tries to be as um, as canonic with its art production as possible, right? It's just a painting. You can hang that painting in the gallery. It's no problem. But it's actually, if, you, if you're throwing this painting away someday, you can just put it on the compost, and after 16 weeks, you don't have to worry about it because it's just gone. Um, so um, I think land art is probably not so interesting for me, but um, perhaps the anti-form movement is something that I can relate to somehow a little bit by Robert Morris. I mean, it was a movement that basically said, hey, we don't want these well-built art structures, you know, not everything has to be well-built, but we want to give the material a little bit space to breathe, space to do its own thing. And I see me a little bit in this tradition of, anti of the anti-form movement. I mean, I'm totally against natural behavior of material. I think I don't, I want to actually avoid all natural or nature um, um, connections because I think this concept is not um, sufficient to describe a lot of stuff. So I think I'm just thinking about how to incorporate materials again because this is what materials do. Materials never stay at a point. They always are in change. This is actually what makes them so interesting. They are there shouldn't be any end point to a material, right? A material is always in flow. So that's something that is interesting for me, yeah. Is that, is that something that... Um, so yeah, if people follow these ideas, perhaps the idea of making art that is compostable um, not in a broad sense. I mean, I, I'm very happy if people do that more consciously. I know a lot of people that do it, but they're not kind of following my approach. I mean, I'm not the one that kind of invented all of this or something like this. I'm just following perhaps a trend that is already there. Um, the archive thing, like how to treat archives different, no, that is something that people are very much afraid to do because it's capital, right? I mean, um, it's also something that if, a, if an artwork is well built, right, if you know it's made from steel, it's made from um, aluminium, or it's made from material that are known to last long, people are willing to invest a lot in this art. Even if it's more fragile, the artwork, people are all also willing to invest a lot if they can also afford the restoration process for the next, I don't know, years, how, how long they will hold this asset. But um, when you see art and capital, you know, together, this relation, then my approach becomes very problematic. Um, but I think this is also part of this work, right, to criticize a little bit the relation between art and capital, between culture and capital, to think of perhaps a little bit different. I mean, I really like this approach of the Chinese. They are not keeping the materials, right? They are keeping the knowledge how to make them. And I think this is a viable approach. A lot of people won't like this here in Europe because a lot of capital is actually in the materials that embody the, the cultural heritage. But um, I don't think 
this can be done forever. I mean, it's impossible that you do this forever because otherwise everything will at some point be cultural heritage and you cannot change anything at all. Uh, you said you don't care about preserving the work, and, but you are also interested in the material and how the material changes. Do you document and follow the changes of your works? in any way or, or you don't care about this? Um, yeah, sure. So, I mean, I am, I'm very much closely documenting how they decompose and stuff like this because I want to know this because I want to establish a protocol that is yeah, very good, like that, that I know, okay, I can use this material, it will stay for this long, I can use another material and it will decompose in that way. So that's why I'm documenting it. Um, actually, the materials that I use, they are totally stable if you keep them dry and at, uh, at a normal temperature, right? I mean, it's the, the, those materials, they don't decompose on their own on a wall. Uh, on a wall. Like de they decompose when you put them in the compost, which is like 60 degrees and very moist, you know, they rot away and they completely rot away. I mean, if you would put, uh, I don't know, um, uh, Caravaggio painting on a compost, it will also very fast, it will also very, very rapidly degrade. It won't perhaps degrade completely, but it will also degrade actually. Um, so, and it's the same with my paintings. If you just keep them on a wall dry, they will last. If you put them on a compost, they will be gone very fast. Okay, I add ju just a little thing to add because I'm very interested in the materials. In, in the beginning of the 19th century and then of, of the 18th century, a new green was invented, uh, arsenic green, which caused a lot of mm, problems because of very toxic color. So it's interesting because there's something in between the history of painting but also the history of conservation and also that has to do with sustainability. So your uh, connection between colors, material, chemical industry is something that I think has a lot of, um, mm, uh, it's an interesting new approach because of the intersection of the many, many fields that are really uh, close each other. People died because of this arsenic green. So it's, um, and um, I mean, you, you probably know about the work of Jens Hauser, right? Um, uh, Jens Hauser is um, an artist and curator and he has established the so-called green studies where he is researching green as a material, as a concept, as the new goal for humanity, going green, the Green Deal, but um, also a lot about materials. And there's a particularly nice book which is about colors that are toxic, and there are actually a lot of colors that, w that were and still are toxic. I mean, just this year, the European Commission actually um, uh, made certain pigments uh, not eligible for tattooing anymore, for example, because, well, data accumulates. A lot of people already have this in their bodies. It's not that bad. I mean, all the really toxic stuff is gone for some years already, but um, there are very interesting pigments, like very toxic greens, but also inflammable rats, for example. <laughs> Studies on colors by um, a, a scholar who is called Maltese here in Italy. But thank you, thank you very much. You got a lot of questions. That's a good sign. And uh, thank you very much.